Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. You, you have a little bit more energy than last week, even though you had an extra hour of sleep. Come on, you got used to this time. How many of you are enjoying it being light in the morning? Anybody? Anybody enjoying it getting dark at like three in the afternoon, it feels like? You're at work and you're like, is it midnight? What, what's going on? Man, this is, that's my least favorite part about this time of the year when it gets gets dark that early, but um, man, we are so excited that you're here today. Again, as Mari said, if this is your first or second time, we are honored that you chose to be here with us today. We have our first all-in at this campus taking place right after the service. We got about 30 people that are hopefully here today that are going to be joining us for lunch and to, to kind of hear about the vision of the church and their next steps and things like that. How many of you are joining us for all-in afterwards? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. There should be more of you than that, but that's all right. We're going to be excited that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you there afterwards. If you didn't sign up, um, as long as there's not 40 of you because we won't have enough food. But if you didn't sign up and you want to take part, let us know. Uh, if you could do us a favor, um, it, we're going to have to set up some tables directly out in the foyer area afterwards. And so if there's anybody who can help us set some tables up, carry some of these chairs that are along the, the outside of the building out there, uh, we would really appreciate that help. If you normally hang out in that area, um, not today. We're kicking you right out of the building. So it's a beautiful day outside. Go hang out outside. Uh, don't play human frogger in the parking lot with the cars, but have a good time, and um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great day. And so we're excited for that. Uh, we are joining or, or starting, I guess, the second half of our sermon series, going through the book of Philippians. Uh, we're in week five of eight. So if you haven't been here, we've been going through the book of Philippians, um, kind of piece by piece, scripture by scripture. Uh, as I said, we're in week five in this sermon series. We're calling Joy in the Midst of Anything, which, as we've said throughout the series, is a, a perfect title for a sermon series in 2020. Because how many of you, 2020 has pushed your, your joy to, a, to, to its limits, right? Like it's been difficult at times throughout this year to experience joy. But what we're talking about and looking at in Philippians is that we can experience joy no matter what is going on in the world around us. And we need to learn to have that type of joy. And so this morning, we're going to be finishing up the second chapter of Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 30. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there. We're going to be there in just a second. If not, we'll have the verses on the screen as well. But that is Philippians 2, 19 through 30. And, and let me just ask you this. How many of you uh, how many of you would say that in your in your personal life and your walk with the Lord, you have like maybe uh, a favorite portion of Scripture or a favorite verse? So raise your hand if you have like a favorite verse, a favorite portion of Scripture, a life verse, or something. You have a verse um, that's maybe on a piece of wall art somewhere in your house or on a coffee cup that you look at every morning when you're drinking your coffee and it incur. Come on, how many of you have a verse that's like your go-to verse in times of need? I can guarantee you that the portion of scripture we're looking at this morning does not contain your favorite verse. I can promise you that the portion of scripture that we're looking at today does not contain that verse. I mean, just think about this letter to the Philippians so far, and we've talked about a couple of these different topics, but if you think about this letter that, that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, uh, it's full with some great verses, some great encouraging, some verses that that I, I know for me have been some of my favorite growing up as a follower of Christ. These are They're, they're in this book, right? They're those coffee mug Verses, You know what I'm talking about? I mean, just think about what, we, what he's covered so far in Philippians. He started off the letter with this, this great letter, this great part of thanksgiving and this great prayer for the church in Philippi. He then encourages them um, with his faith, right? He talks about uh, modeling after his faith. He talks about how his life is all about Christ, right? He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he, he kind of paints this picture of this, this faith to model after. He talks about um, how we as followers of Christ should live lives worthy of the gospel, right? That we should remember. Remember that first and foremost, we're citizens of heaven and we should live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we should be pursuing unity as a church, which only is possible when we live in humility. He talks about that we should have the attitude of Jesus Christ, right? We should have the humility of Jesus Christ. And then what's he talk about last week? We talked about this process of sanctification, that we need to work out what God is working within us, that we need to live our lives without arguing and grumbling and complaining. Come on, how many of you had lots of opportunity to practice that this week? Right? Lots of opportunities to put what we talked about last week into practice. And then we get to this portion of scripture we're looking at today. And if, if you think about it, we're going to cover chapters three and four over these next few weeks. Again, tons of great verses, motivational scriptures that are going to be encouraging and challenging to us. But before we get to chapter three, we got to finish chapter two, which is essentially a travel itinerary. I know. 
really, some of you are super excited. Like how many of you are more excited than ever to be at church? We're gonna talk about Paul's travel plans today. We're getting a glimpse into his, his printed map quest, right? What was he doing in his life? Which I'll just be honest, this is a, a normal thing for him to do. Many of his letters, he, he has what they call the, the travel log or this travel itinerary where he kind of lets people know his future plans, what he's hoping to do, right? It, this is a normal thing you see in letters, but normally this part that we're looking at today was kind of at the end of the letter in, in kind of the wrap-up details, so to speak. But for some reason, what we're looking at today is right in the middle. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is what we're looking at today? Why is this right in the middle? And why is this in the letter first and foremost, but why is it right in the middle of this, this letter? And I wanna answer that question, but before I do that, I wanna ask you this question. How many of you have ever read the Bible and as you're reading the Bible, you're reading about these, these men and women of faith, and you just feel like these are just, these are just like superheroes of the faith. Anybody ever read that? And you're like, man, like these are amazing. You read about Abraham and Moses and, and David, you know, fighting a, a, like a giant, and you go, man, these people are amazing men and women of, of faith. And I, I would love to be used by God. I would love for my life to matter, but I don't, I don't have what it takes. Come on, how many of you ever read that? Like, you've, you've just kind of thought that as you, I, I know there's many times where I read and I'm like, man, these people, they did amazing things for God and they were great men and women of faith and I don't, I'm just kind of a regular person. Like, I'm, I'm not like some superhero. I don't have these, like, I've never used a slingshot so I don't think I could take out a giant. I don't even know if I'd want to be in that battle, right? I, I, like, I, I've never done like um, these amazing things. I've never split any kind of sea with a staff. I've never done any of those things. I don't think I have what it takes. I'm not, a, I'm not a huge spiritual giant like some of these people in Scripture. And not only that, but the very beginning of the book of Philippians we're looking at today. I mean, just think about the examples that we've got to follow so far. Paul says to follow his example and to follow the example of Jesus. Those are the two examples he's been given us so far to model our lives. Out. Now, I don't know about you, but those are two hard models to live up to. Now, you think about Paul, right? He wrote basically half of the New Testament uh, he had this amazing conversion experience where he was going to persecute the church and on the way to persecute the church, God literally showed up on the scene, blinded him, knocked him off his horse, right? Called him to be a missionary and completely and radically changed his life. Anybody, you have a conversion story that's like that? No, I'll tell you mine, right? When I was growing up, I got saved every single service during summer camp from the ages of seven to 13 because I was really just scared of going to hell. Anybody else? That's your story? <laughs> I think I sinned between yesterday and today's service. I need to get that taken care of. That was my, it was, like, I don't have this amazing conversion story where God showed up out of the sky and said, Ryan, you're going to serve me in ministry. That'd be awesome, but I'd be lying. This is Paul. It's like, well, I can't live, like, Paul literally is a spiritual giant. I cannot be like him. Okay, who else you got? Well, then you should have the attitude of Christ. Well, he's God. Paul's pretty good. Jesus is up here. I'm not anywhere near that. And so then I look at this portion of scripture and I think this is why this portion of scripture is directly where it is in the book of Philippians, right in the middle. Because as we're gonna look at this portion of scripture today, Paul's gonna make mention of, of two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus, which I'm not sure if that's how you say his name, but that's how I'm gonna say it. You fake it till you make it. Just speak their names. We're one around. He's not here to change it. <laughs> These are just normal people. They're just normal people average guys, ordinary people who are examples of, of living the lives that Paul has talked about so far in this book. He's talked about modeling your life after Christ, and he's going to give us two examples. He's given us the, the what our lives should look like, and now he's going to give us two practical examples of people who are living this out that we can model our lives after. And the reality is it is. It's really, really easy to read the Bible and to put these people, these characters that were real people, to put them up on pedestals and to elevate them to these places of perfection, and to think that they never messed up, they never had made any mistakes, they never struggled with doubts, they never had any issues with their, their faith, they never had any struggles with temptation, but the reality is, it's not further from the truth. The Bible is full of imperfect people, sometimes average people, ordinary people, that God was able to do extraordinary things through their lives. So the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, it says, now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us 
to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. The big idea that I wanna keep coming back to today and that I want us to kind of leave here with remembering today is that ordinary people can live extraordinary lives through God's power at work within them. Ordinary people, you may be in here today and say, well, I'm ordinary, I'm just average, I'm kind of a nobody, and I would say that's a good place to start. You're a perfect candidate for God's power to work in your life because the Bible is full of examples of ordinary people who lived extraordinary lives, did extraordinary things, not because of their own gifts, talents, and abilities, but because they were open to God's power at work in and through their lives. So if you say, man, I'm just a nobody, I would say, welcome to the club. You're a great person that God can use. You're in a great place today. I wanna read this portion of scripture and then we're going to, to kind of break it down. And we're gonna talk about four traits we can see in these two men's life uh, that, that lead to ordinarily extraordinary lives. I'm gonna screw that up at some point, don't judge me. We're gonna talk about four traits of the ordinarily extraordinary. And so let's look at Philippians chapter 2, 19 through 30 today. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interest. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things will go with me. And I am also confident in the Lord that I myself will be coming to you soon. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he has been longing for you and was distressed because you heard he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him and that I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for this time we're gonna have in your word today. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you speak in every part of your word to us. God, I pray right now that you would open our hearts to hear from you today. I pray for every single person in this room who maybe is here today and feels like they are not qualified, are not good enough to be used by you. God, I pray that as, they look at, as we look at this portion of scripture and we look at these two men, Lord, that you would change our hearts. You would allow us to see that, that if we give our lives to you, submit our lives to you, God, you are able to do extraordinarily more than anything we can hope, dream, or imagine in and through our lives. And so, Lord, we don't wanna limit you or put you in a box or put our lives in a box. We wanna be obedient to what you want us to be, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we break down this, this portion of scripture and talk about these four traits, I wanna start by saying this, and I wanna encourage you by saying this. These traits that we're looking at this morning in these men's life, these are not traits that you are necessarily born with. These are, are traits and characteristics that you can develop in your life. These are things that can be developed over time as we surrender our hearts to Jesus and we submit to his leading and we walk in obedience to him. These aren't just qualities that people are naturally born with. And so you may look at these things today and say, I don't have any of these. And I would say, that's okay. You can begin to build these qualities in your life. And so as we talk about these four traits, I want you to remember that these are four traits of people who live ordinarily extraordinary lives. The first one, if you're taking notes, is this. You need to learn to be a selfless servant. Be a selfless servant. Now, I know we've talked about this before during this series and other series, and we'll talk about it many other times because it's all throughout Scripture. This idea of living a life of service. That you, as, follower, as a follower of Christ, have called not to be served, but you have been saved to be a servant, to serve others, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and your strength, and to love and to serve your neighbor as yourself. Listen, it's ordinary to live a life where you're consumed with just yourself. That's ordinary. Join the crowd. Look around you. Most people are living their lives in that way. That's ordinary. It's extraordinary to live lives where you're not just focused on yourself, your own needs, your own desires, but you're focused on serving other people before yourself. And if we're gonna live ordinarily extraordinary lives, then we need to learn to shift the focus away from ourselves and learn to have our eyes focused on the other people 
around us. We see this early in these verses when he talks about Timothy in verse 20 and 21. He says, for I have no one else who is like-minded, who will genuinely care about your interest. All seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So he's saying Timothy, like Paul, has a, a heart and an attitude for the people of the church in Philippi, just like he did. Paul was a, was a pastor. He was a shepherd. He had a, a special place in his heart for these people. He cared deeply about their interests. He cared deeply about their walks with Christ. He cared deeply about their development and their, their needs. And he says that Timothy was like him, had the same mind as him. He cared the same way that Paul cared about this church. He cared about this church. He had an, an outward focus. He cared about their needs. He was actively living out what we talked about earlier in chapter two and verse four where it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, consider others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others as well. He was actively living that out. He was modeling what Paul has been talking about throughout this, this portion of Philippians, to have an outward focused life. But it's not just his desire to serve others that's apparent. It's also that he has an interest in the things of Christ because he says this, he says, all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He says, otherwise, there's other people who are serving, there's other people who are, who are focused on others, but they're not focused on others because of Jesus. They're focused on the others because of their own selfish interests or their own selfish motivations. And he says, that's not Timothy. The reason he cares about you, the reason he's outward focused, the, the reason he's concerned about the things that are going on in your life is because of his relationship with Jesus. It's an outward flowing of the inward transformation that Jesus had made in Timothy's life, right? You can serve people, but you can serve with the wrong motives and the wrong heart. He's saying, listen, if you're gonna serve people, you need to do it from the right place and the right heart, which is that you love God with all of your heart, soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and that love for God radically transforms your actions, and you begin to look at your neighbor and the people around you different than you did before you knew Jesus, it's an outward flowing of an inward transformation that God has made. Ultimately, again, we're following Jesus' example. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples when they were, as we probably have done in our lives at time, arguing about what it looks like to be the greatest. He said these words in Luke chapter 22. He began, they began to argue among themselves who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and the great men lorded over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it'll be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, greatness in God's kingdom does not look like greatness in the world's kingdom. It looks different to experience greatness and to be great in the kingdom of God. He says greatness in God's kingdom isn't about living to be served. Greatness in God's kingdom is about living to serve others, first and foremost, to choosing to be last. If you want to live an ordinary life, continue to live simply for yourself. Continue to focus on, on your own needs. Continue to show up every single week to church with a consumer mindset. What's in it for me? If you want to live an extraordinary life, then you need to change your perspective, shift your perspective. Instead of focusing on yourself, you need to learn to focus on other people's needs. How can I be a blessing to others? That's what he's saying in this portion of Scripture. Now, I know we all struggle with being selfish at times. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. It is natural. We are born selfish. It's a natural. In fact, I would say at the root of every sin we struggle with in our lives is selfishness. And one of the ways that we can learn to, to deal with this selfishness in our lives, one of the greatest ways that we can learn to deal with the selfishness is to learn to learn, to look for opportunities to serve other people, to live selfless lives. It's practical. In fact, I can make it really, really practical. Ready? The more time you invest in serving God and serving others, the less time you have to focus on yourself. That's just, I mean, that, like, like this is not common core math. This is real math, right? The more time, you only have so much time in your life, right? You only have one life to live. The more time that you focus on yourself, the less time you have to focus on God and serving other people. But the more time that you focus in your life looking for opportunities to love God with all you have and to serve those around you, the less time you have to live a selfish, self-centered life. So look for opportunities to serve because if you wanna live an ordinary life, just keep doing what you're doing. But if you wanna live an ordinarily extraordinary life, then you need to learn to be a selfless servant. 
The second trait we need to develop if we're gonna live ordinarily extraordinary lives. Number two, we need to learn to develop Christ-like character. Develop Christ-like character. He goes on to say in verse 22 about Timothy, but you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Timothy was a man who has developed his character. He served with Paul as a, almost like a spiritual child. Paul was his spiritual father. He, he taught him. He, he, he ministered with him. He learned from, from Paul's example. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? He, he lived with Paul, with Paul, and he saw his example time and time again, and he built his reputation. He built his character by what he saw modeled in Paul's life. Character is something that every single one of us need to develop if we're gonna live lives that are not just ordinary, but that are extraordinary. And the thing about character is it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It's not developed overnight. It takes time. It takes work. It's, it's, it's developed over time. It's about continually thinking the right thoughts, continually uh, developing the right attitudes, doing and saying the right things, having the right actions, right? Building the right habits. Over time, as we do those things, our character is built. He says, brew, uh, build proven character, character that's built over time. Time. Winston Churchill, he said it like this. He said, character may be manifested in the big moments, in the great moments, but it's made in the small ones. We often see people's character in the great moments, right? We see their character in the heat of a battle. We see it then, but it's not built then. It's built in all the small moments leading up to that. It's built in the, in the daily decisions that we make in our lives, the daily choices we make to be the people that God has called us to be. In fact, Paul encouraged Timothy as he was a young man, a leader in the church in 1 Timothy chapter four, a letter that he wrote to Timothy as he was leading the church in Ephesus. He wrote to him and he said this. He said, don't let anyone think less of you because you're young, but be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. Set the example. Let your character be above reproach. Live your life in a way, say things, uh, love people, act in such a way that people know that you have proven character. The choices you make, listen, not in just one moment, but the choices you make consistently over time prove your character. And so how do we, do we develop Christ-like character? What are some steps? Let's make it real, real practical. What are some steps that we can begin to take to build this Christ-like character that will allow us to live ordinarily extraordinary lives? The first thing that we need to do is we need to learn to control our thoughts. Because the battle always starts up here, doesn't it? We need to learn to control our thoughts. We need to learn to, to allow God to transform the way we think, which, which happens when we spend time in God's word and we submit our thoughts to him. We submit ourselves to him, right? We need to learn to control our thoughts. The Bible says this in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. We have a choice when it comes to our thoughts. We are not victims to our thoughts. We need to choose. When we have a thought that doesn't line up with God's word, we have two choices. We either make God's word match our thoughts or we take our thoughts captive, the Bible says, and we line it up and we make it obedient to the truth of God's word. The one leads you to destruction. The other one leads you to life. We have to choose when it comes to our thoughts that I'm not gonna focus on things that don't line up with the truth of God's word. If my thoughts are, are in opposition to God's word, then God's word doesn't change, my thoughts change. Because my thoughts are the ones that are wrong, God's word does not change, and it is never wrong. We take our thoughts captive, we start the battle up here, then we also have to learn to guard our heart. Not only our battle in our mind, but we also have a battle in our, our heart. Everything we do flows from our heart, not our physical heart, but that center of who we are, that emotional center of who we are. It flows there. And the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, it says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. What you give your affections to, what, what consumes your affections and the attention of your heart determines the course of your life. And so you need to protect it and you need to guard it and you need to make sure that you are focusing your heart and your affections on the right thing because what you focus on directs your entire life. He goes on to say this, the Bible goes on to say this in Proverbs, or Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 through 20 says, but the words you speak flow from the heart or come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and lying and slander. These are what defile you. Again, all of these things that defile us and lead us away from Christ are, are started in our hearts. And so we need to, again, guard our thoughts, control our thoughts, but we also need to then guard our, our emotions and our hearts. 
Third thing, that we need to practice Christ-like values and virtues. We, we, we focused on our thoughts. We now focus on our hearts. Now we got to fig, fig, figure out our actions. We got to focus on our actions. We need to choose to, to live in such a way that our actions line up with what we say we believe. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says this in verse 5 through 9. It says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance. Patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. We need to learn to develop the right actions that flow from the transformed heart and a transformed mind. And then the last thing, if we want to build proven character, I would encourage you to surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with the right people. You need to surround yourself with people who are going the same direction that you want to go with your life. Spiritually speaking, you need to surround yourself with people who are, who are following Jesus, who are gonna encourage you to follow Jesus, who aren't gonna pull you away from Jesus. I used to tell the teenagers when I worked as a youth pastor this all, all the time, right? Show me your, your top five friends and I'll show you your future. You are who you hang out with. Eventually you're gonna be, they're, they're, you're either gonna bring all of them up or they are going to bring you down to their level. Who you choose to surround yourself with is vitally important if you're going to develop the right character. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, it says this, don't be fooled by those who say such things. Bad company corrupts good character. Surround yourself with the wrong people, you'll develop the wrong character. Surround yourselves with the right people, godly people, you're gonna develop the right character. And we need to develop this character if we're gonna live ordinarily extraordinary lives. We need to have character that has been proven, that is consistent. So I wanna encourage you to start making some of these decisions. Now, the third trait we see as we're moving through this this morning, the third trait we're gonna see is we need to learn to be faithful to our calling. Paul goes on to talk about Epaphroditus and he says this in verses 25 through 29. He says, but I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my needs. Since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor. You know, we don't know a lot about Epaphroditus. We know more about Timothy, right? You hear about Timothy more throughout the New Testament. He traveled with Paul. You hear about him mentioned in different letters to different churches in the book of Acts. You, you hear about Timothy. We, we, we know a little bit more about Tim, Timothy's history. We know his father was a Greek, right? His mother and his grandmother were Jews. They were the ones who led him to the Lord. They were the ones who taught him scripture. And, and the Bible shows the importance of, of parents in their kids' lives, right? You have a responsibility to, to, to disciple your kids, that's not the church's job, that's your job, right? That's why we, we wanna resource and, and come beside you as parents because we want you to do your job well. We wanna help you as you raise up the next generation. And so he didn't have a dad that knew Jesus, but he had, he had a mom and a grandmother who knew Jesus, who knew God and taught him what it meant to follow God. And then Paul became like his, his spiritual father, kind of took him under his wings. We don't know any of the details about Epaphroditus' life. He's only mentioned two times. We don't really know much about him, but we do know this. We know that he was a, a messenger from the church of Philippi. He was a member of that church. He wasn't necessarily the pastor. He was more of a lay person. We know that they sent him to visit Paul in Rome to bring this message, to bring a, a gift of money, right? They'd taken an offering, a love offering for him. And he was bringing this money to Paul to be a blessing to him. But that's all we really know about his life. And now Paul is sending him back because at some point during the journey, he got very sick. And so he said, sending him back to the people so they don't worry about him anymore. And, 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 he, and he says, listen, when he comes back, you need to welcome him with honor. And we have to understand why there's such an emphasis on honor because the culture at that time was an honor and shame type of culture, much more than the culture in America where everybody gets a trophy, right? It's a different type of, of culture. And so in this culture, uh, he could have looked like a failure. 
The church in Philippi might have looked at him and been like, well, you went, but you got sick. You were more of a strain on Paul. You didn't, we should have probably sent somebody better than you. We probably should have sent somebody else that wasn't going to get sick. Like we made the wrong choice because you got sick. You're kind of a, a failure. You didn't really do a good job. It would have been easy for them to have that opinion. And so Paul says, as he's delivering the letter, Epaphroditus is the one who is bringing this letter back with him to the church of Philippi that Paul wrote for them. And, the, and he says in the letter, you need to welcome him with honor. He's not a failure. He succeeded in his mission, honor him and, and, and receive him and, and celebrate him, throw him a parade if you need to, because people like him deserve honor. And he, and he talks about Epaphroditus and he mentions a couple different characteristic traits about him. He says, you should celebrate him. He's not a failure, he's a, su a success. He's my brother, he says. Shows this, this, this identity of being, of being a part of the body of Christ. I love that, that in scripture, it refers to us as brothers and sisters in Christ that we've been adopted, that the relationship we have isn't just as friends or acquaintances or Facebook friends. Or we, are, we are family, the Bible says. We've been adopted by Jesus into the family of God. We are united. There's a connection between us that is, that is blood, not our blood, but Jesus' blood in our place. We are united as family. And he says, Epaphroditus, he's a brother. He's not a stranger. He's my, my brother in the Lord, but he's not only my brother, he's also my coworker. He worked hard. He labored with Paul. Maybe Paul was the guy that was at the front. Maybe Paul was the guy that was up on the stage preaching. And, and Epaphroditus was working behind the scenes, helping him, ministering to him. And he says, listen, that's just as important. He's my coworker. He, he wasn't my worker. He wasn't somebody that just was serving me. He's my coworker, my co-laborer. He's worked with me. He, he's continued, even though he was sick, he continued to serve with me. And not only that, but he's not only brother and coworker, but he's also soldier. Paul, Paul refers to a term that he often refers to when he talks about the Christian life as, as, a, as a soldier, as a battlefield. How many of you understand that, that we're called to be laborers, but we're also called to be soldiers. We're also called to be ready to battle. How many of you understand that there is a spiritual battle that's taking place in our world and that we need to be ready to be on the defensive, but also to be on the offensive when it comes to the spiritual battle that we're experiencing in this life. And he says that Epaphroditus isn't just my brother. He's not just a worker and co-laborer, but he's also, he's also a fellow soldier. He went to battle with me as we faced spiritual wars. He, he was ready to fight with me even though he was sick. He, he never gave up, even though it would have been easier for him to give up. He continued to fight. He continued to labor. And then he starts talking about these other two phrases that aren't necessarily in representation of his relationship with Epaphroditus, but Epaphroditus is ew, there. His relation, I told you I was gonna butcher it. His relationship with the church at Philippi. He says, he is your messenger, and your minister to my need. That you guys sent him with the message from you to me. And he didn't fail in that. He brought the message. He accomplished his purpose. And he also sent him to be a minister, right? He wasn't just sent to, be, to bring a message. He was sent to also be of assistance. Paul says he was a, of assistance to me as well. He was not only your messenger, but he was also ministered to me. And not only did he minister to me, he made up for what was lacking in your gift. What you didn't give, he provided that. Even though he was sick and even though it would have been easier for him to give up. I, I can uh, I guarantee you in that culture, it would have been easy for Epaphroditus to feel like a failure. It would have been easy for him to feel like he, he didn't do what he was supposed to. Maybe he went out there and he was like, man, I have these, these amazing goals of what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna serve Paul really, really well. We're gonna do this amazing ministry. I'm gonna be such a blessing to him. And then at some point along the journey, he gets sick and maybe he feels like a failure and maybe he feels like he wasn't successful in what God has called him to do. And it would have been easy for him to feel that way in that culture. And Paul wanted to assure him that he wasn't a failure, that he was successful in what he set out to do. And we need to understand this this is the way that God looks at, at failure and, and success. Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham, he said it like this. He said, success in God's eyes is faithfulness to his calling. Success in God's eyes is faithfulness. We tend to measure success based on results, don't we? As long as this happens, if these are the results I get, then I'm successful. If this is what I do, then I'm successful. He says, you should stop focusing on the results, which aren't really up to you at all. And you should just focus on being faithful because success in God's eyes isn't about results. Success in God's eyes is about learning to be faithful to whatever he has called you to do. We need to learn to worry less about failing and worry more about simply being faithful. Be faithful to your calling. That calling changes at times throughout your life. But the one calling that doesn't change as a follower of Christ is that you're called to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That call never changes. 
And so wherever you're at right now, wherever you're working right now, instead of looking how you can get out of that job and move on, maybe just be faithful to your calling to love God and to love others in that place. Just be faithful to your calling because God's not looking for you to be successful by the way the world defines success. He's looking for you to simply be faithful to your calling. And then the last thing we can do, and we're gonna end at this point, if we're gonna live ordinarily extraordinary lives, I wanna encourage you to live for something that's worth dying for. I love that Paul says this in these last couple verses, verse 29 and 30 says, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for what was lacking in your ministry to me. Honor him because he risked his life. Honor him because he was consumed with living his life for the good news of Christ. He lived his life and was willing to lose his life. He counted the cost to minister to Paul, he traveled about 800 miles, just in case you were wondering, from Philippi to Rome. He traveled about 800 miles, which in that, in that day would take about six weeks. Six weeks of traveling without modern medicine. How many of you ever been on a mission trip to a third world country? Yeah. Any of you ever get sick on the mission trip? You ate something you shouldn't have ate and your stomach was like, shouldn't have done that. We don't know what his sickness was, but we know at some point on the journey, at some point as he was going there during this six weeks, he got deathly sick. He literally almost died as he did this. But I don't think he would go back and change anything. In fact, when you, when you see it, what, what does it say? What does it say his concern was when he was heading back? He wasn't concerned with the fact that he almost lost his life. His concern was he was worried about the church that was distressed, the church of Philippi. He said, uh, he, he said he's been distressed because he knows that the church was worried about him. He was more focused, even when he was almost dead, he was more focused on the way that other people felt about him and, and how they felt and how they were worried about him than he was on his own, on his own needs and his own life. Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this. He said, life isn't worth living until you found something worth dying for. You're not really living life especially the life that God has called you to live, if you're not living the life with purpose. If you're kind of just going through the motions, the Bible says you're not really experiencing the life that God wants you to live. You're living a pretty ordinary life if you're not living for purpose, if you're not living for something that's actually worth giving up your life for. In fact, Jesus said these words in Mark chapter eight that I wanna close with today, verse 34 through 38. It says, calling the crowd to him to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the son of man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Let me encourage you as we close this morning, as you just stand with us together, as we close in some worship, I just wanna encourage you to live for eternity, to live with eternity in mind. Can I just tell you this? The, the best use of your life which again, we only have one life to live. The best use of your life is to live your life for something that's gonna outlast it. The best use of your life is to live it for something that's gonna outlast it. And so I just want you to ask yourself something as we close this morning. Maybe you just close your eyes for a second so you're not distracted, but I just want you to think about this as we close today. Ask yourself this, what am I giving my life to? What am I living my life for? Is what I'm living my life for, is it gonna matter five years from now? Is what I post about consistently, is it gonna matter five years from now? Most of it won't matter five minutes from now. Is how I'm living my life gonna matter five years from now, 20 years from now, for eternity? If the answer to those questions is no, then let me just encourage you as well as I can that you're kind of wasting your life. You're wasting your life. You're living for something that has no eternal value. As we close this morning, man, I just wanna challenge us. I, I, I believe that as followers of Christ, God has called us to live ordinary, extraordinary lives. It doesn't matter what your talents are. Can I just tell you, the best ability you can have is availability. That's the best ability you can have. Some say, man, look at my abilities. Your abilities don't matter. The best ability you can have is availability, a heart that is open to God to, to work through you. 
A heart that says, listen, I wanna, just, I wanna challenge you to pray this prayer as we leave, ready? This is the most dangerous prayer you can pray. God, use me. God, use me. God, use my life. Use everything I am. Use my, my hurts, my past. Use everything, God, for your glory, for your purposes. I don't wanna live my life selfishly. I don't wanna live my life for myself. I wanna live for your glory. I don't care that I don't have the greatest skills. I don't care that I'm not the best speaker. I'm not a great worship. But none of those things really matter. I wanna live my life for your glory, God. So use me. You've created me. You've saved me. My life is yours. Would you pray with me as we close today? Father, Lord, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. God, I thank you that, you that you love us, that you've called us to live lives that are worthy of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you, God, that you have not called us to settle for ordinary lives, but you have called us to live lives that are extraordinary. Lord, that your power works best in our weakness. And God, so we give you our weaknesses, we give you our lives, and we ask you to use us today. Lord, I pray for anybody who's in this room today who doesn't yet know you. God, I pray right now, Lord, that as you're drawing their heart, your, their heart to you, God, that you would just allow them to surrender their heart to you right now. Lord, as they just pray in their own words to you and they open their hearts to you, God, I thank you that you're beginning to do a work right now inside of them. You are drawing them to you. From this day forward, they're gonna walk and live as your followers. But for the rest of us, God, who are following you, God, I pray that you would convict us with the holy conviction and the holy discomfort in our lives, that we would stop settling for wasted lives. We would stop settling for comfortable lives. We would stop settling for, for lives where we rely on, on things that aren't you. But God, we would be completely consumed with you and your purpose. God, I pray that you would use our lives. Let us live lives that are worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.